How's everybody? Well, me too. I love this weekend. I love Baptism Sundays. They're so much fun. It's incredible to watch people go in public with their faith. It's such a celebration. So many stories. So many stories. So here's what I've got. We've, we're in this message series, the series called Believe It or Not. And what we're doing is, is we're tackling the hardest subjects that we find in the Bible, the ones that, that, that are difficult to understand or believe that the Bible presents. But also, we're tackling the subjects in the Bible that if you, if you connect with this, you exercise your faith, you, you trust what God says about it, it'll completely radically transform your faith. And so week one, we, we talked about what's the, what's the first thing that, God, that the Bible presents um, that is hard for us to get a grip on. And that's the reality of that there is a God. He's eternal. He made all things. He has a purpose for us. Um, that he has a standard and we didn't meet it. Um, and that he gave his son so that you and I might have a relationship with him. That's, that's, that's a big one. Then the second week, if you remember of this series, and by the way, all these are online um, on our YouTube channel, but the second week we talked about our enemy. Um, and we have a spiritual enemy, the devil. He's real. He is not a feeling or an emotion. He's not a circumstance that you're going through. He is a um, intellectual personality that was created and his desire is to thwart God's plan for, for your life. And then last week, Fernando gave y'all hell. And, um, and you looked at that and, and worked through that thing. And, uh, and so this week, we're going to talk about heaven you got to have the, the counterpart, and so we're going to talk about heaven this week, and, and I have like 10 minutes to tell you everything I know about heaven, so <laughs> this is going to be really comprehensive as we go. Now, heaven's an incredible story, and it's an incredible thing for us to look at, and it's important. The Bible lets us know that, that one of the things about heaven, the reality of heaven is, is that our faith is strengthened when we consider the reality of heaven, how big a deal um, that that is. And so that's what I want to do. I want to just spend a few minutes with you and I want us to look at the reality of heaven. How many times have you ever used heaven as a reference point? And it's like heaven. That's heaven. You know, maybe you're describing a, a vacation or an encounter, something happened with your family. Maybe you held your baby for the first time or, or maybe you're, you're describing your spouse. Don't we do that, right? Well, our spouse is like heaven. <laughs> heaven, boy. Woo! Heaven. Um, or something else. Maybe it's food, you know. I, maybe I've done that. I don't know. Um, but we use heaven a lot of times as a reference point. But here's what's crazy. You might say, you know what, this is like heaven. But the truth is, as we study scripture, we're going to find that heaven's unlike anything we've ever experienced. I'm convinced that there are not words that can adequately describe the circumstance, the scenario, the trimmings and the trappings of heaven. I just don't think it can. In fact, the Bible struggles with it. John, the, the author of the book of Revelation, when he describes heaven, what does he talk about? He talks about streets and fencing and gates and stuff like that. I mean, that's not the bigger things, is it? When, you, when you're talking about the, the things in your life that mean the most, that are the most valuable, I haven't heard anybody say, you know what? What's really changed my life and what I really love about it is asphalt. Asphalt's really amazing. Don't you love the asphalt in this city? It's the best asphalt I've ever seen. No, you don't describe that. Those are the lesser things. But why, do, why, does, why does John start there? Because heaven's just indescribable. It's, it's too, too far beyond. We live in a broken world that's affected by sin. It's affected by a broken relationship with our creator. And so you and I have to look through the lenses of that brokenness. And the truth is there are some things that, that, that have to do with eternity that you and I just have to scratch at the surface and do the best we can to stretch our brain to sort of wrap around it as best we can. But in no way do I think we're really going to take it in. Heaven is an incredible place. It's an incredible place. So what I want to do is I want to, I want to give you a couple things to think about. Two things that I want you to at least put in your hip pocket, carry it around with you for a little bit when it comes to the issue of heaven. What makes heaven heaven? First thing is this. Write this down. Heaven is heaven because God's there. That's the number one reason why heaven is heavenly. That's the, that's the number one reason why it's a place you want to go. That's the number one reason why it's somewhere worth making an effort for. It's, it's worth thinking about. Why? Because God's there. You know, oftentimes we think of heaven as being a place where we get all the material things that we want. You hear about those streets of gold, and you're like, oh, we got gold. We're going to have gold. Or, we, or maybe there's so your mansion. We're going to live in a mansion, y'all. Going to have a big yard. And all. I remember even as a kid, we used to sing worship songs. We talked about our big, big yard. Y'all probably never sang that. But we sang that song. And I sang the best I could. 
But in reality, I don't want a big yard. I got a big yard now. I hate it. I hate my big, I would I, round up. That's the, that's my thought. But, 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 you know, you think about all the stuff you're going to get, but what makes heaven great isn't what you're going to get in heaven. It's who's there. Now, listen to what the psalmist writes, and I'll, let's let these words just sort of soak in a little bit. Psalm 16 and 11. It says, you will show me the way of life, granting me the joy, listen, the joy of your presence and the pleasure of living with you forever. The psalmist says that there's this special joy in the presence of God, and, and there's this, this incredible pleasure of living with him forever. That's what the psalmist says. What's the joy and the pleasure of living in the presence of God? And why is God the, the hallmark feature of heaven? Why is God so particularly important when it comes to the blessing, if you will, of heaven? It's for this reason. Where God is, there's a lot of stuff won't be. There's, wherever God exists, there's a lot of other things that can't exist in his presence. Let, let's, let's start here. Let's start with worry, okay? Let's just start there. I want you to think right now, I want you to think of that one thing. Now, maybe you got 10. If you need to think of 10, think of 10. I'm not limiting you, okay? But I want you to think of some of the primary worries that you have in your life, those chronic things that you go back to and you worry about and you go back to and you go back to, stuff that keeps you up at night. Stuff that just plagues you. I want you to think of that. Maybe you can narrow it down to that one worry, okay? Just that one worry. What is that one thing that you're like, oh my gosh, I hope that don't happen. And you worry about it. Maybe, maybe it's your health. I hope my health doesn't fail. Or I hope somebody that I love and it's really close to me, they don't get hurt or die or something else. Maybe that's your worry. I don't know. Maybe it's, maybe it's a financial worry. Maybe it's something else. But I want you to take that number one worry, that one thing, that, that grips you. Think about it for a second. And then I want you to think about this. In the presence of God, it no longer exists. You no longer have to go back to it. You don't have to worry about it. The Bible says in heaven there will be no death. There will be no sickness. There will be no sorrow. There will be no separation. That's what the Bible says. In the presence of God, those things that you've hung on to. Now think about the relief for a second. Think about just, I mean, just consider this for a second. What would life be like if you didn't have to worry about that or think about that anymore? You don't even have to, I don't have to worry about that anymore. It can never happen because God's with me and he's close. Can you imagine the relief? Can you imagine what that would be heaven, wouldn't it? That I don't have to think about that anymore. Let me ask you this question. How many of you spend time Keeps you up at night considering, worrying about, you know, fretting over the bubonic plague. Who's got some fears? I'm a little nervous. Nobody? Good. I, I want to make sure. Um, you know why? Because it's not a possibility, right? You don't worry about the bubonic. You hadn't, you hadn't given it a minute's thought. When was the last time you thought about the bubonic plague? Probably when you were in, like, history. But besides that... You didn't, don't think about it. But if I were to take you back during this, the season of time when the plague was ravaging the world, you know, what, you know what you would say? It would be your number one fear, your number one worry, your number one concern. I guarantee if you lived during that time and you buried family members and you were tending to sick children and whatever else that was going on during that, if you, were, you would say, that's my greatest fear, my greatest worry, but you don't think about it all today. You want to know why? Because it doesn't exist now. There will come a point and this is heaven, y'all. Listen, there will come a point that you and I will walk into the presence of God. Today, we practice his presence by faith. We practice it by faith. But one day, our faith will turn to fact. And when the fact is this, God is near and he's close to you, you won't worry anymore. You know, maybe maybe your, your brain will snap back every once in a while for an opportunity to worship. Maybe every once in a while, your brain will snap back and go, oh my gosh, what are we going to... And you go, wait a second, hold on. God's here. I don't have to think about that. I don't care that anymore. Why? Because all things are under his control. He is right here. There will never be any more separation. Why? Because he said that would be so. We'll never have to be sick. What well, Doctors, out of work. No more morticians. No funerals. No funeral processions. No disappointment. No brokenness. All gone. The, the hallmark feature of heaven is God. In the presence of God, where he is, there's a lot of other things that can't exist. And guess what can't exist in the presence of God? Worry and fear. It won't exist. And in heaven, in the context of heaven, those things will be gone. They'll be banished. 
I don't even, I can't even wrap my brain around what it would be like not to think about something coming to an end, not to think about someone getting sick, not to think about what if, what if, what if, what, 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 I don't even know what that might look like. And I don't think you do either, but that's heaven. That's heaven. That's what the Bible tells us for sure. Let me give you a second thing that makes heaven heaven is that heaven is heaven because God is there. But secondly, heaven is heaven because we're there. God has spent all of human history doing one thing. You know what he's been doing? Collecting together for himself a family that he could spend forever with. He says we're his kids. And he loves us. Isn't that crazy? We're his knuckleheaded kids. You know what I mean? And God says, I still love them. I want you to know. You know when Jesus was baptized? You know why Jesus was baptized? To identify himself with, with God's kids, with us. He wasn't ashamed of you and me. You know, I'm ashamed of me a lot. Are you ashamed of you sometimes? Oh, I'm just so ashamed of me. God says, I'm not ashamed of you. I want, I want the world to know. You're mine, and I love you. You belong to me. We'll be in heaven. You're, you're pretty special to somebody, and there's going to be some somebodies in heaven, listen to me, that are pretty special to you, and it's going to be a fantastic reunion day. You know, as a pastor, I have the opportunity to minister to and be with and near people who lose people, who go on, who die and pass away, and I'm there. I preach funerals, and, and the pastors, our staff, and our, our church do the same thing. And it's a tough thing. But I'm looking forward to the day when one of these days, these, these moms and dads who've lost kids and this, these, this, this brother that lost a sister and, and this, this mother that lost a daughter and, and all the other scenarios that life throws at us with death, I look forward to the day when I get to be there and watch those people because of the work of Jesus, because of the finished work of the cross, because of redemption, because of the promise of a future that God gives us in Christ, I look forward to that day when they get to come back together. I can't fathom what it's going to be like one day. When there's this mother who said goodbye to this precious baby, one day there's this, this person, I don't know who it'll be, is out stretched arms and here's this baby and mom is running to it. That's her child. Can you imagine? I don't even know. I will cry if I think about that that much. To think about how God is going to undo the damage and the pain and the hurt of life. That is heaven. That's heaven. That's why we look to it. That's why we consider it. That's why we celebrate it. That's why we as Christians look forward to when this life comes to a close because for those of us who have dug into the passages and the pages and the words of this book, we've come to the conclusion that this isn't the best ending. The best ending is yet to come. And God has promises for those who have trusted him of a place that I just struggle to describe it's way beyond our capacity or vocabulary, probably beyond our ability to even consider it, that God has prepared a place for us where these things that vex us won't exist anymore. I love this verse. Philippians 3, 20, 21 says, but we are citizens of heaven. That means we belong to a community and it's not here. And by the way, it's a very diverse community. Um, heaven is going to be a very diverse place. It's going to be an incredible place where we will fellowship with each other. You don't even know what it's like, nor, nor do I, what it's like to have a relationship with other people and not have to be suspicious, not have to be concerned. You, you and I have to lock each other out of our houses and stuff because we don't know what each other might do, right? We don't know what someone's intentions are. You, you might look at somebody and you go, man, they, they, he seems like an okay guy, but I don't know because you don't know. You'll see this person, like, they all look like regular or whatever. And then the next thing you know, you're like, look what they did. That dude was a looney tune. I didn't even know it. He seemed like a good guy. I mean, he cut his grass on an angle, which is weird. But, I mean, so what? It's a big deal there. You know, just figure he's a mathematician, geometry. I don't know. I don't know what the deal is. But one day, you and I will have a relationship with each other in heaven and you don't have to be suspicious of it because there is no sin in that relationship. You don't have to worry about someone taking advantage. Every thought and action towards each other will be pure. And it'll be for the first time in our life we'll experience what it's like not only to be loved and in the presence of God, but to be loved by each other with a genuine, unbroken love that's not tainted by sin and all the brokenness that this world has in it now. It's going to be amazing. It's going to be heaven. Paul writes in Colossians chapter 3, he says this, he says, set your sights on the realities of heaven. Why does Paul tell us to do that? Because while we're here, if you're not careful, you'll get sidetracked by short-term distractions. 
You'll look around here and think, boy, it's really important for me to get this or do this or accomplish this. Oh, I better get that. You got to get that degree. You got to get that money made. Got to get that relationship. Listen to me. All those are short term. Heaven is eternal. God says, constantly look. Paul says, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he says, you need to be looking at this. Think about this. Hold on. This is not the end of the story. For those of you who are depressed, you're going through a season. I get it. We go through some seasons while we hear this. Stink, don't they? But God says, hey, don't let that season make you believe that that's how it will always be because it won't. God says, my final word says that you will be with me in a place that is paradise. It'll be far beyond what you might ever imagine or expect. Fix your eyes. Focus on these things. It's a way that we get through this. It's a way that we have something to look for. It's a way for us not to get distracted by the stuff that glitters and glows here. There's something better. It's the message of the gospel. Through Christ, I have a relationship with God. And God has prepared a place for me. Not because I deserve it, but because of his great love. And not just for me, but for all who believe. Heaven. What a place. I I remember talking to my grandmother years ago. And there was a generation of people that have since many of them gone on. I remember when you would talk to them, oftentimes you'd see their face sort of, their eyes sort of glaze over and they would talk about heaven and they would long for something. I don't see that as much in our generation. They longed for something that was beyond now. And I think one of the reasons why they did is because pastors were faithful back in those days to speak of the realities of heaven and bring it back into the forefront of our thoughts so we might know what's really important. I, I would love for you and I to get to a place where As much as we enjoy the opportunities that are forward to us here, we look forward to what God has planned for us forever, even more. I pray for that. I pray our church gets like that, that we become heavenly minded, that we're not temporarily stuck in the things that the world has to offer that can never fulfill. But we look forward to a day when we're with the Lord and we get to do some things and stand before him and celebrate in a celebration that won't end, eternity, the presence of God with each other. It's heaven. We have a chance for that. I want to pray with you. And we're going to baptize some people. Bow your heads with me if you will. Father, we are grateful. We celebrate your presence in our life. We thank you for um, the opportunity today, God, as we celebrate people who are going forward with your plan and your purpose for them, God. They are taking their faith public. Father, I pray for them to be strengthened, Lord. I pray for them to be encouraged today. And I pray for each one of us to be inspired by the faith that it takes to go public the faith that it takes to trust you, the faith that it takes to take up our purpose, our real purpose in life, and live our life for you, for your glory and for your honor. Lord, we love you. We celebrate your presence today. We offer this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. We've got an incredible story. Y'all listen to this story. Isabel, and please excuse my stage fright. <laughs> um, I am truly grateful to be here today to share my journey to Christ with you. Um, my life before Christ was probably just like so many others here today, very lost. I lost my father at a young age of 12, and that impacted my life a lot. I croaked growing up with alcohol and drugs because I didn't really want to confront my feelings and the feelings of grief that I was going through. I never thought or cared about where I would go in life and having that little respect or knowledge about where I wanted to go, I fell into a major deep depression. I felt so unaccomplished, so unloved and inferior to the world. I started to break down in tears at every turn. And then after that, I was put on antidepressants that turned me into a numb zombie. During that time, I could feel something strong pulling me, something outside of my own comprehension, like a child kind of tugging at the shirt of their parents. One day I decided to sit in on a service near my home in Houston, and of course, I broke down in tears. Uh, But at that moment, I realized God was powerful. That was my first experience finding Christ on my own. And not long after that day, I started medical school. I started to 
finally meet my soulmate. And I stopped taking antidepressants. And for the first time in my life, I had the thoughts of starting a family. And believe me, no one in my family thought that I would have kids. <laughs> Not because I didn't want them, but because I never thought I would find the right person to share them with. Without even realizing it from depression, I fell from God after that. I grew up never really knowing him and my family was not very religious unintentionally. I had no clue where to serve Christ or how to even start. So falling off at that point was easy for me after gaining a little bit of joy in my life. But life as we know it began to become difficult again and today I realize that I needed Christ fully and completely. But not only when times get hard. My husband will tell you his story, but his com as his companion, through his condition, had presented a new, very difficult challenge in my life. Trying to support him any way that I can, trying to be a good mother to our beautiful angel, and moving to a new state away from close family, and our first home had created all new depressions for me. But God knew that my little family needed him more than ever because his pull for us was so present and so powerful at this time. We decided to look for churches near, near our home here in Sherwood after we finally settled, and that church stood out the most. And after our first Sunday here, we were so spiritually enlightened from the message that we had received. It was so clear to us. We knew we had found our new lives through Christ. Our lives after Christ has been so fulfilling. We have learned so many lessons since being here. We've found peace by living for him, and we have gained so much joy along the way, which is what brings us here today to surrender it all to him. We are so excited to get baptized. I was raised in church. My family made sure I was actively involved when I was young. At church, I was a part of everything, but outside, I felt out of place. I'm a survivor of childhood sexual abuse, and the devil used my complex hurts to isolate me, steal my identity, and keep me hidden from God's purpose for my life for a very long time. But thank God, he loved me too much to allow my story to end like that. I was abused. Thank you. I was abused by a father figure for around eight years when I was really young. The oppression I dealt with became so constant, it even followed me into my most familiar place, church. At every invitation or altar call, I prayed the prayer of salvation silently, even though I'd already prayed it and meant it wholeheartedly before. I logically knew that God heard me and he said I was saved, but Satan caused me to constantly question everything in silence. I tried to compensate for all the trauma I dealt with by smiling all the time and having fun no matter what. I was in fifth grade when I first told an adult about the abuse. I hate keeping secrets to this day, but I kept this one thing locked away in fear the entire time it was happening. But God kept his eyes on me. He made me slow to anger when multiple systems failed to protect myself and my family like they should have. Satan often reminded me of the depths of my hurt through flashbacks, nightmares, and panic attacks. The enemy convinced me that the abuse I didn't cause and the lack of protection that followed proved that I was fragile, foolish, and forgettable. I realize now what an unlikely story mine is without God. He knew how much damage had been done and how much worse I would allow things to become. In high school, I obsessed over relationships. I lashed out frequently. I started partying. I took risks and I did whatever felt truest to me. I decided to do things I knew weren't honorable because I believed a lie from the pit of hell. I believed that everyone who loved me had failed me, including God. I resolved to be in charge of myself thinking I could live with whatever choices I made as long as I didn't have to depend on anyone to keep me safe again. I was suffering spiritually, physically, and emotionally. Even though I eventually found more mature coping strategies, those were useless too. 
I was far from God and I found my worth in deeper relationships based on how healthy and happy I felt. At 27, my eyes started to open. My husband and I were going through painful circumstances and I was desperate for things to become stable somehow. I cried out to God and he had every right to refuse me harshly. Instead, he put his arms around me and he showed me unreasonable grace and mercy. The peace I experienced was tangible. His response to me was better than anything I had experienced in all the years I had been living for myself. I thought I was crying out for comfort to admit that I was helpless and most of all to pray for my husband. But God changed the conversation instantly. In his presence, lies that I had believed for 15 years were undone and I was healed. He had never forgotten me or forsaken me. In the Bible, God shares his regard for his children with Jeremiah. He says, I will give them a heart to know me, that I am the Lord. They will be my people and I will be their God because they will return to me with their whole heart. That verse explains where I am today. I wanna to be baptized because despite all odds, God gave me a heart to know him. In obedience with all my heart, I've returned to him. And I am so thankful that Jesus chose the cross for me. He thought about me in my impossible circumstances. He chose to die so that he could offer me the chance to live in freedom from sin. There was no power in hell that could keep my Jesus from raising in victory over that horrible death that he never deserved. Because he lives, I know that same power to overcome has been poured out over my past circumstances and over my current circumstances. I deserve, I desire to live in his ways because I know now that they're infinitely better than mine. I finally see that I am safe, whole, and free, and I praise God that I get to celebrate today with everyone who shares in his victory with me. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Emmanuel. This is my son, Chase. If you can't tell, we're pretty identical. We have the same eyes, same nose. Heck, look, we're in the same color. No, but seriously, we met Chase in January of 2018. He was in the foster system due to neglect, domestic violence, and drug abuse. When he was removed from his bio family, they were given a certain amount of time to get clean in order to get the boys back. During this time, he and his little brother were placed with a foster family who also attends his church, the Randalls. He lived with them for only a few months before he was lucky enough to be moved to his grandparents. Unfortunately, Chase was just around four and his brother wasn't even two and his grandparents were both in their 70s. Because of their grandparents' age and pre-existing health conditions, the boys were removed yet again and put back into the system. Something really rare happened and went back to the same foster family. They lived with the Randalls and attended this church. I guess God wanted them to be at this church for some reason. When they came back to this church for the second time, that was when we met them. The foster mom was serving in the nursery with my wife, Caitlin. Caitlin saw his brother first and fell in love. When she heard he was a foster kid and had a brother, she asked to meet Chase. She met him and played with him. At that point, her mind was totally made up. And I don't know if anyone else's wife is like this, but once your mind is made up, there's really nothing you can do to change it. She came up to me and told me that we we're going to become a foster family. We've already talked about doing this in the future when we felt more secure or when I was out of the military or just when we were ready. There's something that I read once and it says, yeah, sure, you can foster or adopt whenever you're ready because the children became familyless or orphans when they were ready, right? No. So Caitlin dragged me across the church and forced me to meet with the boys, but I wasn't excited because I knew it was a huge commitment and I heard it was really hard and expensive to adopt. So even after meeting them, I was hesitant, but, after I, went, but I, I went along with it anyways. We asked around the church to find out how to get started. Everyone we asked pointed us to The Call, which is a God-based organization that helps families go through the process of opening up to foster. 
They also help families to adopt children through DHS, which we found out was totally free. Let me say that again. Adopting through DHS is completely free. The call has non-commitment informational meetings every month, so we went to the one that was soonest. I was still hesitant and my wife was still gung-ho. She filled out and signed all our paperwork and scheduled us for training. It was really happening now. We trained and went through the entire licensing and opening process. Through this process, my excitement grew. I was no longer hesitant, but excited now. In July of the same year we met them, we opened. During the six months or so it took for us to open, the boys by your parents choose to sign away their rights. Now they were considered a bit available for adoption. But not only, we were, uh, not only were the boys' grandparents fighting for custody, there were five families on their adoption list before us. We still got on their adoption list, but in our minds, we knew that we wouldn't get them. They're cute and young, and no way that all five families would fall through, so we decided to move on. But not even a month later, we got a call saying that all five of the families fell through. The last family even almost went in to sign their pre-adoption paperwork, but backed out the day before. The boy's adoption specialist was calling to ask if we were still interested. We were very confused at first. We even asked her, what boys? Because we knew, well, we were sure that there was no way we would be chosen. But we were. God works in incredible ways. So we told her yes, and they moved in in August. Once a foster family moves, sorry, once a foster child moves into a pre-adopted home, they have uh, to live there for six months before DHS will allow them before uh, the DHS will allow for adoption. In that time, their grandparents lost their custody battle and we got to know a whole new side of the boys, Chase especially. Because of neglect, he had no discipline and, had, and not getting his way was almost too much to handle. Anything green was not food. His preferred dinner was snowballs and fruit punch. Because of witnessing domestic violence, he didn't know how to treat people, especially girls. And because of everything he had been through, and seen at the ripe age of five years old, he struggles with anxiety and panic attacks. He's been through so much already, more than many of us have been through as adults. We finally adopted him and his little brother in May of this year. Anyone who knows him can tell you the amount he has grown from the six months he lived with the Randalls and the year and a few months he lived with us is not only amazing, it's inspiring. He almost completely corrected his behavior and other things he struggled with. But more importantly, he has developed one of the most beautiful relationships with God that I have ever seen in a child. And today, he is publicly committing his life to Christ. I've never been more proud of him. A lot of his growth is thanks to this kids' ministry, kids' team at this church. They are truly phenomenal. The amount of love and dedication they've shown him and other kids they are blessed enough to hang out with every week is just incredible. The global kids director, Faith Harness, would take him out of class and walk him around when he had panic attacks. Kelly Ann, the Sherwood kids director, would sit down with him and help him grow the process, help him learn how to process his feelings and urges in a way, in a way that would glorify God. The volunteers in his class have all loved on him and taught him so much. One of the kid lead team members, Katie Shannon, even told us that she felt a calling to get Chase a Bible. She said she couldn't shake the urge, so she did. Maybe two weeks later, while I was still deployed, Chase told Grandpa that he had given, he had been learning his, he had been learning in church about giving his heart to Jesus. He said he wanted to pray the big prayer and he wanted to be good and have Jesus in his heart and go to heaven. So Grandpa sat on the couch and read with him from the exact Bible that Katie Shannon got him and helped him pray and commit his life to Christ. He's six. I wish I had the level of dedication when I was six years old. I remember when I was in the Philippines, all I wanted to do was play outside with my friends and not take naps. What kind of, what kid this level, what kid has this level of spiritual devotion? My kid. He is such an amazing follower. He reminds us to pray if we're rushing around and forget. He won't eat anything without blessing it first. He cries or gets upset when he misbehaves or breaks the rules, not because he's in trouble, but because 
he sinned and made Jesus sad. He wants to teach his friends at school about God so they can go to heaven too. He says some nights when he's praying, <laughs> sorry, I'm allergic to something. God just keeps talking to him and won't let him sleep. This kid is seriously something special. I don't know what he's do, going to do with his life, but I know whatever it is, it'll be for God. Caitlin swears he'll be a pastor one day, and I could definitely see it. He's such an inspiration to foster children, to have gone from where he was to where he is now. He's just amazing. Chase, I just want you to know that everybody at this church, your family, especially Mama and I, are so freaking proud of you, dude. Uh, um, one last thing before I give the mic back, um, just throwing it out there, if anyone is interested or have questions to become a foster family or even adopting, please get with me. Um, I serve at the coffee shop, you see my shirts, every Sunday, and my wife serves at the nursery. And there's so many families in this church that will love to give you more information. Thank you. exciting is that, huh? 
Let me tell you a cool thing we do here at that church. Um, don't sit yet. Don't sit yet. You just, it won't be but a second. I know y'all, y'all heard me speak, and you're like, oh, my gosh, here we go. No, <laughs> we're leaving, okay? Um, but one of the things we do is we do something called a victory walk. And so what I want you to do is everybody kind of scoot you in. See where these balloons are? Anywhere there's balloons, get on either side of that. And we're going to high-five the folks that have, have gone public with their faith today. Yeah, everybody, everybody get over there. Get over there. Get over there. It'll all be good. You know, here's what we know. We know that baptism does not save us, but you know what it does? It declares something. It declares our desire to follow Jesus. And you know what? We ought to celebrate that. And so what we're going to do is... As everybody who's been baptized lines up here, we're fixing to send them down. And here's what you're going to do. You're going to applaud. You're going to high five. You're going to say, well done. You're going to say, that's awesome. And you're going to start praying for them today. You start today. Is that cool? All right. All right. Y'all get up here. We're fixing to launch this thing out. So exciting. Let me pray for you right now. Father, I thank you, God, for every person, Lord, whose life has been impacted by the gospel of Jesus that have gone public with it today, God. Thank you for the baptismal waters, Lord. Although we know they don't save us, they do declare something about what you've done for us, God, the new life you've given us. And they also declare, Father, that we give ourselves to you. Father, today, for each person who has gone public with their faith, God, I pray, Lord, the courage to walk into this day carrying the name of Jesus on their sleeve, Lord, to live for you, to pursue you. Not that they're going to be perfect, but they're going to consistently lean into your goodness and your grace and your word and your truth, God, as they live for you. Father, we thank you and love you for all things, but more than anything else, we give you thanks for Jesus, Lord. We offer this prayer and we celebrate today, Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Y'all give them some high fives as they come through. Oh, my God.